Hello friends, we're here today in Luke chapter 10. So most of this chapter is talking about Jesus sending out the, the 72. These are 72 missionaries really, where they were going around and they were, I mean I say missionaries, you know, they're, they're apostles, they're, they are, they're heralds, really. I, I know I've said it before when I, when I begin the Gospels, but the Gospel was a term that they knew back then, where people go around and they will explain to the people that live in a certain area who their king is. They will, they will read a, from a scroll and they'll go around and they'll say, you know, because of this battle, your country has been taken over by our country, and now you are, you know, you are of these people. You know, your, your nationality has either changed or has stayed the same. And this was a common practice. People would go out and they would proclaim who their king was. You know, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have even, like, local posts or governments or something. And especially when things are constantly taken over, you know, you need someone to go around and and tell everybody who their king is. <laughs> so, these people are going around basically doing the same thing. They're spreading the gospel. Now, it's interesting that they're, they're spreading the gospel, but, but Jesus hasn't died yet. When we spread the gospel, we say, you know, Jesus died for your sins so that you may live. And because of that, you know, he is your king. However, when they did it back then, they were just talking about his coming. You know, they were saying, the, the king is here, essentially. And or the, what they're really saying is the Messiah is here, the chosen one. But that meant the king, because back then they were just, they were just uh, waiting for the son of David. Anyways, he, they send the people out, and just to, just to show that, 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 he is legit and that they are speaking on behalf of someone who's supernatural. He gives them the ability to cast out demons and to heal people just like Jesus had been doing. And he, he says something very interesting to me. Uh, it's interesting because it's something that people have started doing today. I don't know if you're friends with many missionaries, but if you speak to people that are going in the Middle East, they'll say that they've, they've found a new method. It's not really a new method because it's talking about it here. They said they'll go into a, a place and rather than just trying to bring, you know, everybody in a certain area, you know, like a Muslim country where there's no Christian inroads, they will go into the city and what they used to do is start a church hoping that somebody would just show up someday and they find out it's not really working. But what they do find is that they'll find a person of peace you know, a son of peace, as it says here. And they will find some person who is who's open, who God somehow communicated to this person through the Holy Spirit and said, you need to welcome these people here so that they may minister to the community around me. And what Jesus is saying is, if you find a person that's, that's like that, then stay with that person. And, you know, God's working, it, God's working it out so if you find these people, you know, they are going to be your inroad. They're going to be, they're going to be the, you know, that maybe the head of the ministry someday. But they might just be the person who's going to facilitate you. However, I mean, however you look at it, Jesus is, or God is working through this, this person of peace, this son of peace. And, and it's a blessing to those people too. You know, when they receive these people, it's like they, they receive it. I, I read a book um, years ago called God's Smuggler. I recommend it to anyone. It is extremely encouraging and it will encourage your faith and it will strengthen it and it will make you want to be a bolder, better Christian. And so what happened in this book is he was smuggling Bibles into past, you know, what was then known as the Iron Curtain. And 
he goes in there and he's got a car full of Bibles and he doesn't know, he doesn't know any contact there. He doesn't know who he's giving the Bibles to, but he knows that God told him to, to go in there and smuggle all these Bibles in. And he said that he started walking next to this man on the road and he looks over and they, they see each other's eyes and he said, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain it any other way except for to say that our spirits recognized each other. And even though this, this man didn't know the language of that place, they just started walking together and they walked together up into the guy's house and the guy let them in and it was clear to both of them that, <laughs> that this man was the, going to be the one that was going to bring them the Bibles. And so it's like he knew it when he got the backstory. He was like, we had been praying for these Bibles. And all of a sudden the man came and I saw him and I was like, that's the man with the Bibles. That happened continually throughout this book. So this little section here where it's talking about how, how they're supposed to go in and they're not supposed to bring anything extra. And they're just supposed to live by faith and find this person of peace. And, and if they don't receive you, just keep on moving. Shake the dust of your sandals off at them. So this was very interesting to me that, that this is here and how, how we're using it today and how, you know, God is, is doing this ministry in the same way today that, uh, that he had been. Anyways, the next section, he kind of gives a woe. I'm led to believe that one of the cities that reject him are, you know, Bethsaida and... and and Khorasan, I think. But he's he's saying, woe to you cities for, for rejecting the gospel. And then the people come back and they're like, Jesus, we, we, we cast out the demons. And they're really excited about the power that came through them. And Jesus kind of comes back and says, look, don't be excited about, about the authority, you know, about the power that, that you saw through my name. He said, you know, you guys should you guys should take joy and you should boast in the fact that that your name is written in the book of life. You know that that you are one of these people that has been given you know the opportunity to to be with God someday. He goes on Jesus goes on and says kind of a a blessing. He's just rejoicing in the fact that these these cities that accepted him and the cities that rejected him may not be the ones that people would have thought, you know, if, if you would have looked at the cities today and think, who's going to accept, who's going to accept the Messiah? You know, who are the smart and the rich ones? You might, you might point at, you know, New York City or Chicago or, you know, big luxurious cities. And, God is not showing any partiality. I, I, I feel like I talk about this a lot. You know, God, God doesn't want, God doesn't want the rich and the smart. He wants, you know, and, but it doesn't mean that it, it keeps you from the gospel if you're rich or you're smart or you're strong. It just means that he's leveled the playing field so that, so that everybody, everybody that accepts the gospel can be from any walk of life. It's people whose, whose hearts have not been hardened. People who, who are looking for God. So after that, a man comes up to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do? What must I do to be, to, you know, to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be part of your kingdom? And he's, Jesus says, well, what does the law say? You know, you should, you should love your Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy is probably thinking, <laughs> I feel like this is how lawyers are today. You know, they, they'll do whatever they can to, like, find the little holes in the law. And so he's thinking about it, and he's like, okay, supposed to love my neighbor as myself. He knows... He knows that he can't do this. He knows he's not justified by loving his neighbor as himself. So he's trying to find a technicality. He's like, okay, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells 
the story of of the Good Samaritan. And obviously the people that were his people were not neighborly, but the Good Samaritan was. You know, and these people, the, the Samaritans and the Jews, you know, like I said in the previous chapter, they really hated each other. But Jesus uses the Samaritan as the example of the good person. And he says, you know, who, who, was, the, who was the right neighbor? And what's interesting about this is that Jesus, Jesus didn't say, follow me. And he wouldn't have. You know, a lot of people that ask to follow Jesus, Jesus kind of pushes away. But if you remember chapters ago, when he brought up all the fish for, for Peter on his boat, Peter put his head down and said, you should depart from me because I'm not worthy to be around you. I'm a sinner. You'll never see Jesus rejecting someone like that. But you have someone who's thinking, okay, what are the technicalities here? Like, how good of a person do I have to be? Jesus is not dealing with people like that. He's, he's you know, actively pushing them away. And he's saying, you know, I, I guess he's just not, he's not interested in the people that are trying to find their way to God that aren't finding their way to God through Jesus. So the chapter ends with an interesting story that I think kind of goes along with whatever with everything that's being said here. There's the story of Mary and Martha. Martha invites Jesus over and she keeps on working in the kitchen and she's cleaning up and Mary's just sitting at his feet listening to him and talking. And Martha goes, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. And Jesus says, no. <laughs> she has chosen the better thing. You know, she is spending time with me. And I I think it's interesting later on when we get to the book of John, it will have the story of their brother, Lazarus, who dies. And Mary and Martha both come up to Jesus. And Martha comes up and says, says, if you were here, you wouldn't have brother wouldn't have died and Jesus kind of replies back to her and you know he's 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 talking with her he's he's using logic with Martha but when he gets to Mary and Mary says the, the same thing if you would have been here our brother wouldn't have died it says Jesus wept you know Jesus had a different relationship with some people than he does with others and I think that Jesus really loved Martha. I think Martha really was a true Christian, but, but we should really have the heart of Mary. Someone who just wants to be with Jesus and just loves Jesus like, like a child would love their parents. So anyways, that is Luke chapter 10. All right, have a great day. Bye.